Well, again, good evening. Everybody's had a great day. We get to finish up this Sunday in God's Word. And I know some of you may be expecting for me to tell you what book we're going to next after we finish Exodus, but I don't know. Um, I, honestly, I'm still trying to pray. That wasn't a joke. I honestly don't know. Um, still praying, trying to figure out where we're supposed to go. But at the same time, I think it's, it's okay because I want to share uh, tonight kind of a, a psalm that's really ministered to me over the past several months and really been on my heart. And so if you'll turn tonight to Psalm 95, we're going to look at it this week. And if, you're, um, if you pray well this week, then hopefully we'll have a new book to go into next week. Psalm 95, and I want to go ahead and read this. Then we'll pray before we kind of go back and seek to unpack it. And this is obviously going to be a lot shorter, right? Last week we went through six chapters, right? We've got 11 verses tonight. So everybody should read the sigh of relief. <laughs> Psalm 95, verse 1. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us become before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God. And the great king above all gods, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is the people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Father, we, again, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the myriad of things your word does in our lives. And, and Lord, we thank you, God, that um, you know exactly what we need tonight, whether that's encouragement or whether that's conviction. And so, Lord, would you take your word and by your spirit, Lord, and do exactly in our hearts what you know needs to be done, that we might leave here made more into the image of your son. So lead us by your spirit. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Did you all hear the story about Chippy the parakeet? Probably not, so I'm going to share it with you. One second... Chippy was peacefully perched in his cage. The next, he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. The problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. The phone rang, and she turned to pick it up. She'd barely said hello when Chippy got sucked in. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, and opened the bag. There was Chippy. Still alive, but stunned. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him, raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then, realizing Chippy was soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hair dryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma, the reporter, who had initially written about the event, contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. He just sits and stares. <laughs> and the person who recorded this story wrote, it's hard not to see why. Sucked in, washed up, and blown over. That's enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. That's a sad story. But it's also kind of a silly story. A silly illustration, if you will of a truth we all know well in our own lives in terms of the, the adversity, in terms of the, the difficulties that, that we face in this life. Psalm 95 is a psalm that, that's really easy to embrace. It's really easy to declare this psalm, proclaim this psalm when all is well in your life, when everything's fair, your prayers are being answered. But it's a different story when you're like poor Chippy and adversity strikes and your prayers don't seem to be heard, and the suffering won't end, and you continue to be treated unfairly. Now, on the surface, this psalm doesn't seem to say anything about those type of circumstances in our lives, 
But I submit to us, the fact is, it's those difficult times, again, that we just mentioned. Those are the times we need to submit to the call of this psalm the most. You know, this, this psalm is a call to worship. It's a call to worship that we as God's people again, are to follow at all times and all seasons of our life. And personally, it's really a call that has challenged me. Now, we all have our strengths. We all have our, our, our weaknesses when it comes to where we are in the Lord. My strong suit, I have to admit, is not faith. You know, some people have this iron wheel mentality. They can handle whatever comes their way. That's not me. Some people, they see a mountain, and their first thought is, let's climb it. I see a mountain, and I'm ready to crumble. My response is, no, going over, no, there's got to be another way around. There's got to be a simpler way around. I'm way behind in the school of faith. But the Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you know what that means? That means God's going to keep us in his school of faith in order to train us up until our lives are pleasing to him. Because the fact of the matter is, God wants us to please him more than we could ever desire in of ourselves to please him. And what I'm learning is that it's often those who have been through the most difficult of circumstances, they have the most advanced degree in God's school of faith. Now, even though we can't control many of the circumstances that come into our lives, again, as it relates to to our physical health or the economy or job loss, the choice of others, what we can control and where faith comes in in the midst of the circumstances of our lives is in how we respond to these things. It's in our attitude in, in the midst of these things. And here in Psalm 4, the psalmist really presents to us, confronts us with four responses that are to define our lives in the midst of whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. And I would say, again, especially when those circumstances are difficult. Now, these four things we're going to bring out, nothing mind-blowing. Okay, You're not going to be blown away tonight with, with, with the points that I give to you. Not that you're ever blown away in anything I say, but especially not tonight. But that being said, our obedience to these things will determine God's ability to work in our life and form us more into the image of Jesus. And again, I pray that they're, they're good reminders for us, as these things have, have, have been for me. I want to give you these four responses, and then we'll, again, we'll walk through these verses and try to unpack them. But what the psalmist confronts us with is that our response in terms of, in the midst of whatever we may find ourselves facing, the psalmist says that we are to be a people who are marked by joyfulness. He says we're a people who are to be marked by thankfulness. He says, we're a people who are to be marked by humbleness, and we're a people who are to be marked by openness. In verse 1, again, we're confronted with the call to respond with joyfulness. Notice again, the psalmist declares, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Now, as we know, there's a difference between joy and happiness, right? We understand happiness is based on circumstances. Happiness is based on happenings, Depends on, and therefore, it comes and goes in our life, depending on what's happening to us. The Bible never calls you and I to be happy, but the Bible does call us and does command us to be joyful, to respond with joy no matter what we're experiencing, no matter what is happening. Now, if our joy is not based on happenings or circumstances, the question then becomes, okay, then what's joy to be based upon? Is it just some nebulous feeling or emotion that we're supposed to work up as believers? Is is, is that what it is? No, the Bible makes clear that our joy has a very firm foundation as believers. Throughout the scripture, our joy is constantly tied and anchored in one place. And that is to our salvation. And notice what the psalmist says here. He says, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation salvation. Scripture tells us we find our joy in one place, in the fact, one reality, that we are saved. In the reality that our greatest need has been taken care of. That our need to be delivered from our sin has been covered. Again, as you know, our greatest need is not physical. Our greatest need is not relational. Our greatest need is not financial or emotional. Our greatest need is spiritual. Our greatest need is to be delivered from that which separates us from God makes up the object of of his wrath, of course, being our sin. 
It's exactly what Jesus came into this world to, to save us from, to die for, to, to rise from, from the dead for, that we could be delivered from this sin. Which means when everything is, is falling apart in our lives and our happenings aren't making us very happy, this is the one thing you and I can always find joy in. No matter how bad it gets, we know if we have put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, we're saved. No matter what happens, I'm not going to face God's wrath. No matter what happens, I've got a home in heaven. No matter what happens, I'm getting a new body. My physical, financial, relational situation will not have the final say on my life. Now, I may have some needs right now that I would really like to be met, but in the midst of all that I lack, I can know my greatest need has been met, and therefore I can have joy. Now, you notice here the psalmist speaks of our salvation, specifically, though, in terms of a person. Right? Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Again, we recognize our salvation comes from a person. It's the Lord who saves us. But being described as a rock, I think, speaks so much about our salvation. Because what do, we, what do we know about a rock? A rock is that which is stable. A rock is that which is, is solid. Again, our circumstances change. They're fluid. They're up and down. But our salvation and the one who provides that salvation, he stays the same. You and I aren't more saved one day than we are the next day. God's not holding you tighter one day and then holding you less tight a few days later. No, he's the rock of our salvation. It's firm. It's stable. And it's the one reality we can count on again, no matter what else is changing all around us. Habakkuk 3, Habakkuk the prophet put it like this in verses 17 through 18. It's a very familiar passage. He says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor the fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Right? Basically, you're having a horrible day. Nothing's working out. Habakkuk says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. We're to respond with joyfulness. Secondly, the psalmist declares, no matter what our situation may be, we're also to respond with thankfulness. Notice verse 2. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. Again, a situation where all my needs are being met, my prayers are being answered, everyone in my family is getting along, my kids get up every Saturday morning, and the first thing they say to me is, hey, Dad, what chores can we do today? Right? It's easy to be thankful. Give, give thanks to the Lord. Come to his presence with thanksgiving. That's no problem when that's happening. But when there's rebellion in the home, when tragedy strikes, when the great plans that you worked for for so long and you saved for for so long fall apart, then what is natural is coming before the Lord with complaining and negativity, right? whining, anger, even depression. As I said, we can even bring those attitudes to the Lord. Right? We can come into his presence, and these are the things that end up coming out. And again, it's not that God doesn't want us to be open and honest with him. We know that. We read the Psalms. God wants us to, to come as we are and pour out our heart. But at the same time, it's easy in those times for our flesh to, to simply focus on all that we don't have in that moment or to focus on what we have and don't want to have instead of being thankful for what we still do have. Paul presents this same truth, Philippians 4 and verse 6. He says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, again, you know the verse, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And of course, Job is such an example of this very truth. I mean, this man who, who lost his finances, he lost his kids, he lost his health. His wife says, Job, you're going to hold on to your integrity after all this. Job, no, here's what you need to do. You need to curse God and you need to die. And you remember Job's response? Job said, shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Basically, are we, are we only going to love God and thank God when things are good? 
and not do the same when things are bad? Or we think of the example of David in 2 Samuel 7, when he comes before the Lord and, and wants to build the Lord a temple. This very noble desire to honor God, to give him a, a permanent place where he can reside. No more in the, in the tabernacle. To honor him, to show that he is the true God. And yet, God, through the prophet Nathan, comes to David and says, David, I'm sorry. I'm saying no to that prayer. I'm not going to let you do that. That's not for you. And yet, David's response was not to throw a pity party. Right? David's response, after all I've done for you, God, after how I've served you, you won't let me do this one thing? No. His response, as you remember, was to begin to praise the Lord and thank the Lord. Okay, I can't do this, but thank you, God, that you've chosen me and my family out of all the families in the world to be the family through which you would allow the king of Israel to come. We see the importance, again, of thankfulness all throughout the scripture. We see it in, in, the, in the law, that God would create an offering, the thank offering, for the children of Israel to offer. And again, not just here in Psalm 95, but as we've gone through Psalms on Wednesday nights, we've seen over and over and over God's call to give thanks. This reality is to define our lives as believers. But even in those times when we feel like there's nothing that we can thank God concerning what he's done for us, even in those moments, the psalmist goes on to make clear we can still have a heart of thankfulness because we can still thank him for who he is. Again, notice the next few verses, verse 3. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. The psalmist says we can, we can thank the Lord and praise him simply for the fact that he's the great God and he's the great king. He rules over all. We can thank him that, that he's in charge and has authority over all things. And the psalmist points here specifically to God's role as creator to highlight this. Right? He's the one who holds the deep places of the earth. He, he's the one who, who the tallest mountains belong to him. He's the one who made the oceans and the seas. And then put the, the land masses in the midst of it. And, and the point is, if he's over all creation, then it means he's over our lives which means there's nothing that comes into our lives that he doesn't have authority over. And so no matter what's happening or not happening, we can give him thanks for that truth. We can give him thanks simply for who he is. So how do we respond to what life throws at us? Psalmist says we respond with joyfulness. He says we respond with thankfulness. And then he says we respond with humbleness. Notice verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. Now, as you know, in the scripture, the position of bowing or kneeling is to take a position of submission before a superior. It's, it's an acknowledgement that you're in the presence of someone who's, who's greater. Therefore, it's a sign of humility. And this is what the psalmist calls us to as, as God's people. And he tells us the one that we are to bow before, the one that we are to, to kneel before, the one we're to humble ourselves before is the Lord our maker. The creator God that the psalmist was just describing. Again, this call to, to submit to the fact that he's in charge. Now, the fact that, that God is the maker, that can kind of mess with our minds sometimes and make us think, okay, okay, if he's the maker and I'm going through this, then why doesn't he make things differently? Right? Well, why doesn't he make a change? Why doesn't he make things better? But the psalmist is presenting to us our response, our call, our attitude, and whatever we find ourselves facing is not only to thank him for the fact that he's in charge, but as much as we may not like it, we're also to lay down our will before him. Okay, you are in control. Okay, God, you are the maker. And so I'm humbling myself before you right now. I know you could stop this. And I'm praying that you would stop it. But you know best. And I don't. And so I'm submitting to you. I'm humbling myself before you, acknowledging that you're in total control here. And your ways are best. Of course, we think the example of Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his arrest, when he prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. 
And again, from the lips of Job in chapter 13 and verse 15, these just amazing words, when Job was able to declare, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. To be able to say, even if all of this gets to the place where my life is gone. If that's how bad this is going to get, if God allows it to get even to that point, to where my very life is taken, even then, I'm going to trust him. Even then, I'm going to humble myself and submit to him and acknowledge he knows best. And I love the fact that the psalmist doesn't just give us this call. Then in verse 7, he gives us some reasons why this submission why this attitude, why this response is the right response. He says in verse 7, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The number one reason why it's right to have this submissive heart, this humble heart, is simply because he's God. He is our God. We submit and humble ourselves for this simple reason. He's God. And that's enough reason for you and I to bow our will before him. As someone said, I've, I've learned two things in life. Number one, there is a God. And number two, I'm not him. I mean, simply the fact that he's God, that is in of itself enough reason for us to submit ourselves and humble ourselves. But even though that would be enough, notice the psalmist doesn't stop there. The psalmist reminds us, not only is he our God, who, as he described earlier, is a rock, but he is our God who is a shepherd. Yes, he's God, but he's not a tyrant God. He's not an ogre God. He's a shepherd God, which makes us his sheep, which makes us the people of his pasture, specifically the sheep of his hand. And the imagery here is as a shepherd, the one who is God chooses to care for us and watches over us as his sheep. Again, Psalm 23 spells this out in in such detail. And by describing us specifically at the end of verse 7 as the sheep of his hand, it it speaks of just the special care and protection that God gives. You remember remember Jesus spoke in a similar language in the New Testament. He said, he says, no one will be able to snatch his followers out of his hand. See, we can willingly submit and, and bow no matter what we're experiencing because the one we're submitting to is holding us. He's caring for us as a shepherd in his very hand this place of protection, this place of care. These things aren't happening because God's aloof. These things aren't happening because God is cruel. No, in the midst of whatever we're we're going through, he's a shepherd who is intimately caring for us. He's so intimately aware we're in his hand. But not only are these hands a sign of his care and his compassion, they're also a sign of his strength. He's, He's holding us with the very same hand that holds the depths of the earth. We need to tie verse 7 back with verse 4. When we read, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. Think about that. The same hand that's holding the deepest places of the earth. That no man is able to go to, no man has ever seen. The very foundations that, that hold us right now, these deep places, the same hand that's able to contain them is the same hand, the psalmist says, that's holding our lives this very moment which means no matter what we're going through, he can handle it. It's not too big for him. And so we can let go and we can humble ourselves. We can bow before him. We can kneel before him and we can trust he's enough and he'll see us through. The psalmist finishes with one final call. And that is in whatever season of life we find ourselves in, especially in I would add times of adversity, not only to to respond with joyfulness, not only to respond with thankfulness, not only to respond with humbleness, but we're to respond with openness. Notice verse 7 continues. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. When we go through hard times, and again, it specifically speaks here of trials in these verses. There's this temptation. We've already kind of alluded to it, but there's a temptation to allow bitterness to seize our hearts. Again, this mindset, if God's in control, right, he's the maker, he's sovereign, and he allows this, 
Okay, maybe he's strong, maybe he's mighty, but he must not be very good. A good God would not let this be happening to me right now. If this is what God allows, then who needs him? It's the ability to have this mindset, I can take better care of myself than that. Now, now sometimes it's not that pronounced. I think a lot of times we would never say that. We would never verbalize that, especially as believers. But what can happen is is there's a hardness that we can allow to, to grow in our hearts. And oftentimes it grows even without us noticing it. It's not even necessarily something we intend. But we just find we don't pray as much as we used to. Or we don't worship like we used to. Or we're not in the, in the word like we used to. Or, or we're, we're responding a lot harsher to people around us. Because again, what happens is we have that anger, right? And we would never lash out at God, right? We know better than that. But what happens is that anger then begins to be redirected to those that are closest to us. And so now we're lashing out at our spouse, or now we're lashing out at our kids, or now we're lashing out at a kid, when, when the issue is we're not really angry at them. The real issue, if we're honest, is we're angry at God. And they're taking the brunt of it. Because God hasn't come through. He hasn't fulfilled the desires we wanted him to fulfill. The psalmist is warning here against responding this way. God's trying to teach us. God's trying to reveal himself to us. And we close ourselves off. And he's telling us it's the opposite that should define our hearts as believers. That a right response to difficulties of life, a right response to the trials we find ourselves in, is to have an open heart to what God wants to teach us in the midst of of these circumstances. Now, remember, Israel, they had a hard time in the wilderness after leaving Egypt. We we just studied this. It was not a cakewalk. It was not a vacation. It was difficult. It was hard. They had times God called them to camp in a place where there was no water. You can't get by very long without water. They, they, They found themselves not having the same food that they had enjoyed all those years in Egypt. In fact, the word that's translated rebellion There in verse 8, do not harden your hearts as in in the rebellion. That's the Hebrew word Meribah, which you you remember was what they named the very place where the children of Israel camped. And they began to complain against Moses and Aaron and and ultimately the Lord because God brought them out and there was no water. And this is where God had Moses strike the rock and, and, and the water flowed out. They named that place Meribah. God didn't direct them in the way they wanted or the way they thought he should, or in the time they wanted. So again, they felt disappointed. They felt abandoned. They felt forgotten. They felt unloved. Their attitude became, okay, if this is what you allow to, to happen, God, then you must not be much of a God. We, we were better off when you weren't around. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt? Basically saying, obviously, the gods of Egypt provide better than you do. And as the psalmist says, they rebelled by their complaints by their distrust. They, they hardened their hearts. They wouldn't receive the truth God was trying to, to reveal to them, how he wanted to, to teach them, how he wanted to, to unfold more of his character to them, wanted them to understand he's their source. He was all they needed. And even though they got their water, even though God met that need, they missed the greater blessing that God wanted to do in their lives, and that was to reveal more of himself to them. So the psalmist again is speaking of this, and he Again, continues, don't harden your heart as in the day of rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Verse 9, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, though they saw my work. Even though Israel saw what the Lord did, even though they experienced his faithfulness, they saw his provision, they saw it through the plagues, they saw it through the Red, the Red Sea. You talk about seeing a provision, yet in spite of all the evidence of, of God's work, and his faithfulness in their past, they wouldn't trust him for their present. Again, God had them here because he was trying to grow them, to stretch them, to build their faith, build their understanding of who he was. And instead of being open to the trial, instead of being open to the things he was trying to work in them and work out of them, again, they hardened their heart and notice they turned what God meant for a trial to them, to train them, they turned it into that which was testing the Lord to put it back on him, questioning him. Verse 10 says, For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, 
and they do not know my ways. And we recognize we all have moments where we struggle and we complain and we whine and we get bitter. It's called being human. We all have those times. And God knows that. God knows our frame. He knows how frail we are. He, he, he made us. He knows we're dust. And it's part of being human. The issue for Israel is that this went on for 40 years. The issue was this was perpetual. On and on and on with this attitude and, and this hardness of heart. And as a result, God says, I was grieved. And that doesn't just mean God was, was sad and he shed a few tears. What it means is there were things God couldn't do in Israel that he desired to do because of their attitude, because of their response. He was grieved from working in, in, in the fullest capacity that he desired, that he had saved them for. It's why the New Testament warns us, for instance, in Ephesians 4, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That we can stand in the way of the things of the Lord. It's not that God's powerless. That God, it's not that God can't do it. It's that we put ourselves in a position where we can't receive it. You know, God's primary work in our life, after we receive the Lord, is to conform us in the very image of Jesus. It's what, it's what Romans tells us. It's what, what Paul tells us. That's why we were elected. That's why we were predestined. That's why God called us and saved us and justified us, that we might be conformed to the image of his son. And the Bible tells us that some of God's greatest tools to do this conforming work, again, are difficulties and disappointments and, and delays and dead ends. Now, I don't like that. I don't understand why the process of becoming like Jesus or the process of becoming holy or the process of sanctification, whatever term you want to use, I don't understand why that just can't be a, a, a touch from a magic wand. And boom, there you are. It's probably because God doesn't use magic. That's probably the answer to that question. But again, you, you get the point. God doesn't work this way. He uses adversity. He uses time. And if during that time, if during that adversity, we go, as the children of Israel did, astray in our hearts, if we allow our heart to turn away from him and harden against him, if we don't, as the children of Israel did, don't know his ways, if we don't understand this is how God's work, if we don't know that his primary ways of shaping us and molding us and making us into the character of Jesus are through the trials and the difficulties and the hardships and the delays, then we'll harden ourselves. And just like Israel, we'll, we'll grieve him. We'll keep him from doing all that he wants to do in us. And on top of that, we'll do is what happened here to Israel in verse 11. We'll fail to enter into the rest that God so wants to give. Notice the result of this. Verse 11, so as a result, God says of this hardness, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And the result for the nation of Israel, of their response to their situation, their hardness of heart was there was no rest. And when we understand for them, that rest was physical land. That rest was that first generation that came out of Egypt was not able to, to enter in to the promised land. They weren't able to enter in to the, to the rest of the land of Canaan. But again, there's an application for us because for us, a failure to remain open to the Lord and what he wants to teach us means we will forfeit rest, not, not physical rest, but we will forfeit spiritual rest. We'll grieve the Spirit's work in our, in our life and the peace and the rest that he so longs to, to give us even in the middle of our situation. I mean, the Bible makes clear the heart of God is that we would enter his rest. Again, it doesn't mean the storm ceases. It just means we can have a stability. We can have a, a peace, a calm in the midst of it all. It's having what Jesus had. Right? When he was able to sleep, even though the boat was in the middle of the storm, it's having what Peter had when he was asleep in a jail cell. Having been arrested for crimes he didn't commit, knowing that his buddy James had just been beheaded for the same so-called crimes. And again, this physical rest is just simply a, a picture of, of the greater rest, the spiritual rest that we can have on the inside. As I said, the scripture makes clear, this is God's heart for us. Remember what we just read back in Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14. God's promise to Moses was this, my presence will go with you and I will give you 
rest. And of course, the very well-known verses of Jesus, his promise in Matthew 11 and 28 through 29, when he said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so we really have one of two options. We can continue to, to fight with the Lord and harden our heart at what he's allowing, and as a result, continue in a place of turmoil, have rest, have a lack of rest in our circumstances and have a lack of rest in our spirit. That's one option. Or we can say, God, I don't like this. In fact, God, I hate this. God, I'm asking you to change this. But in the midst, I know you're using this for my good. So please keep my heart soft. Please keep my heart open to hear what you want to teach me through this. And if we choose option two, the promise of the scripture is not only will the Lord use whatever we're going through to mold and shape us more to the image of Jesus, but he'll bless us with a rest and a peace even in the midst of this. The ability to know that none of this I'm walking through is wasted. To know none of this is meaningless. It's so easy to suffer and think this is meaningless suffering. But God will give us a rest and a peace to, to understand there's no such thing from heaven's perspective as meaningless suffering. It's all working for us an eternal weight of glory. And it's all under his sovereign control. And so tonight, I told you this would be short. Tonight the question is, are you worn out from the circumstances of your life right now? Do, do you need rest? The Lord makes it available. And it may not be physical rest. In fact, the physical, the circumstantial may actually heat up and become more intense and more difficult. But spiritual rest. And again, it doesn't have anything to do with controlling our circumstances. It has everything to do with controlling our response, controlling our attitude in the midst of them. And again, the psalmist reminds us when we respond with joyfulness, when we respond with thankfulness, when we respond with humbleness, and when we respond with openness, that this is what opens the door for this rest to fill your and my life. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord just to hide this word in our heart. Bring the encouragement, bring the conviction that we need tonight. Um, Father, very simple word, very simple truths. Lord, probably nothing in this that none of us in this room have, have, have never heard before. But Lord, we so easily forget. And Father, you know the things that we are walking through right now. You know the circumstances we find ourselves in. And as much as we wish we could change them, Lord, we recognize that the only thing that we control, again, is our response. And so, Father, I pray that you would take this call of, of the psalmist and you would burn it in our hearts. And, Father, tonight where we need to walk in joy, Lord, based on upon our salvation, God, that we would press into that. And remember what you've done for us, Lord. That even though all of our needs in the moment may not be met, Lord, you've taken care of our greatest need, the salvation of our soul. And that we would find joy in that, Father, where we are finding ourselves ungrateful and focused on all the things we don't have in our life right now. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would give us a heart of thankfulness. Lord, if even there's nothing in our life right now we can thank you for, that we would thank you for who you are the creator God, the one who is in control, who is sovereign over all things. And God, then we would humble ourselves before you as that God. We would bow our hearts, God. We would submit to you that you know best, Lord. And no matter what you allow to happen, God, that we would rest in your sovereignty, in your control, Lord, because you are God and because you are the God who holds us in your hand. God, you will always do what's best. We are near to you. You haven't forgotten us, Lord. And then ultimately that we would have a heart of openness, Lord. And where bitterness, where hardness may have crept in, and maybe you put your finger on that tonight. We haven't even recognized it. We haven't even seen it, Lord. Maybe your spirit's putting 
his finger on that tonight, God, that we would confess that. And God, you would melt that heart of And you would give us an openness, Lord, to, to be teachable and moldable in the midst of what we are going through, Father. Recognizing your ways, Lord. Recognizing your, your plan, how you work. And Father, that as we do that, we would rest in you know that rest, know that peace, and even though the world's swirling around us personally, even though the world's swirling around us just living in this day and age, we can know that rest, God, that you bring in our souls. So God, do this by your spirit, and we thank you, we love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.